Hi guys, today we're going to read a book specifically for my fourth graders. We read this every year when you're learning about um, the American Revolution and the federal uh, period of American history. And so today we're going to talk about our second and third presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. This is called Worst of Friends. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and the true story of an American feud. You know what a feud is? A fight. A fight. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. Can presidents be pals? Not often. Now it's true that Andrew Jackson thought President Martin Van Buren was absolutely tops, and George H.W. Bush called Bill Clinton a real friend, but lots of presidents didn't think very much of each other. After all, President Truman once called Richard Nixon a shifty-eyed liar. Theodore Roosevelt said President McKinley had the backbone of a chocolatey Claire. So your backbone is like your stick to itness, your character, um, all those kind of things. And a chocolate eclair is a donut. That's only somebody who has a backbone of a donut. Your squishy backbone. Anyway. Uh, and Andrew Jackson, who always had strong feelings, th thought James Buchanan was such a big jerk, he wanted to make him ambassador to the North Pole. Somebody's the ambassador to some place. It means they have to go there. Have improve relationships between the two countries. So you're the ambassador to the North Pole. He wanted to send them to the North Pole. <laughs> of course, some presidents just weren't friend very friendly types. Uh, people said that John Quincy Adams was as hard as a piece of granite and as cold as a lump of ice. Nobody much liked Benjamin Harrison either, possibly because he had a handshake like a wilted petunia. Some presidents had wives as best friends and a bachelor, James Buchanan, spent most of his time at the White House palling around with a 170-pound Newfoundland dog named Lara. But thanks to history books, we know that two U.S. presidents turned out to be some of the best and worst friends ever. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were the best of friends, even though they were completely different. John was fat and Tom was thin. Tom was tall and John was short. Tom was rich and John was not. John was fond of telling jokes. Tom liked to play the violin, and that was only the beginning. Excitable John could talk for five hours straight without stopping. Quiet Tom sometimes didn't say three sentences together in public. They were as different as pickles and ice cream, but that didn't matter because Tom and John were best friends. They walked together, they talked together, and of course, they took care of each other. When Tom caught cold, John's wife Abigail worried about his sneezes. And when John's daughter needed new corsets, Tom ran out and bought her some. Unfortunately, he wasn't sure what size would fit. But best of all, Tom and John had the same big, wonderful ideas about America. And whenever they had a chance to work for their country, they did it together. Which one's John and which one's Tom? John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. Back in 1776, when British King George was trying to force the 13 American colonies to obey harsh British laws and pay unfair British taxes, Tom and John got busy. Noisy John, who was one of America's best talkers, told Americans to kick out King George and make America an independent country. Shy Tom, who was one of America's best writers, sat down and wrote the Declaration of Independence to tell King George the colonies were free. And together, Tom and John helped make America a brand new nation. I think those are the same mice from the other book. Mm -hmm. Then, when the new nation needed money to pay its bills and friends to help it fight off enemies, Tom and John sailed across the ocean to Europe and talked kings, merchants, and prime ministers into helping America. That was tough work, but they did it together. And when British King George, who was still pretty mad at the friends for helping America become independent, rudely turned his back on them during a court ceremony, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were insulted together. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, King George III. So naturally, you might think that Tom and John would always agree on everything about America, right? Wrong. Around 1790, they both came back from Europe and something happened. For the first time, Tom and John had really different opinions about their country. And when it came to deciding how to run the brand new United States government, the two best friends just couldn't agree. John said the president should always be the country's biggest, strongest boss because a really strong and powerful president could defend the country's laws and protect the people's freedoms. Tom said, no way. He told everyone that a really strong and powerful president might break the country's laws and take away the people's freedom. In fact, said Tom, 
An extra super strong and bossy president might even try to make himself a king. And Tom wasn't going to let that happen, so he just had to fight against John's crazy ideas. That upset John. Without a powerful president, John pointed out, the whole brand new United States government might just fall apart. And John wasn't going to let that happen. So he just had to fight against Tom's crazy ideas. Now, of course, John and Tom were very polite. They didn't hit each other or shout. But instead of walking out talking together, they went their separate ways. Soon, Tom told all of the people he knew that John was vain, suspicious, irritable, stubborn, and wrong. And John told, told all the people that he knew that Tom was weak, confused, uninformed, and ignorant. All the moms are covering their children's eyes. And naturally, people took sides. By 1797, when John was elected to be the second president of the United States and Tom was elected vice president, lots of Americans had different thoughts about how to run the country. One group, the Republican Party, agreed with Tom's ideas. The other, the Federalist Party, agreed with John's. And the parties began to fight. Some Republicans and Federalists actually battled in the streets. Others crossed the road to keep from meeting. Everyone called each other names. The fighting even got so bad that John had to have a special guard posted in front of the house to protect him from crazy people who absolutely hated having John as president. Poor John, he really wanted to be a good president, but there were so many problems. First, he had to find money to buy more ships for the Navy. Then he had to keep the United States from going to war with France. And on top of all that, John had to move into the brand new president's house in the brand new capital of Washington, D.C. But the paint and the plaster in the White House weren't dry yet. And when Abigail hung her wash in one big empty room, it dripped. Can you imagine? Still, John's biggest problem was the Republicans, led by his old friend, Vice President Tom. No matter what John said or what he did, the Republicans were always criticizing and t saying that John was a repulsive, gross fool. They even called John his rotundity, which was a fancy way of saying his royal high fattiness. John hated that, and sometimes all of the complaints and names and fighting made him so mad he just took off his wig and stomped on it. So in 1800, when Tom and John both ran for president, they tried very hard to beat each other. John urged the Federalists to make speeches, write articles, and hold picnics, parades, and barbecues to tell everyone that he would be a very good president. Tom urged the Republicans to make more speeches, write more articles, and hold more picnics, parades, and barbecues to tell everyone he would be a better president. And when after the election Tom won, John was not a good loser. Instead of staying in Washington to congratulate Tom at the inauguration, John sneaked out of town on the 4 a.m. stagecoach eight hours before his old friend was sworn in as president of the United States. After that, John didn't talk to Tom, and Tom didn't talk to John. John went home to his Massachusetts farmhouse. He built, built stone walls, he split rails, and sometimes he complained about the way Tom was running the country. Tom went to live in the White House as president, and of course, one of his biggest problems was the Federalists. No matter what Tom said or what he did, those Federalists were always there, complaining that Tom was a scoundrel who ate fricasseed bullfrogs and criticizing him for buying the state of Louisiana and a lot of other territory. And when Tom, who liked studying science, filled up the White House with 300 dusty old mammoth bones and said that real live mammoths might actually still live in the American West, the whole Federalist Party said he was doodle-brained and laughed like crazy. Aren't they trying to bring? Aren't they trying to make bring a mammoth back to life with with DNA and cloning? I don't know about that. But Tom stayed calm and went on complaining about the Federalists. Finally, after two whole terms as president, Tom retired and went home to his Virginia mansion. His hair turned white. His joints got stiff. But Tom read his six thousand seven hundred and seven books. He rode his horse, Old Eagle, and he organized snowball fights and running races for his 12 grandchildren. Sometimes he thought about the good old days when he and John had worked for American independence. Sometimes he must have missed his old best friend. And when an acquaintance asked about John Adams, Tom said John was honest and great. John stayed in his Massachusetts farmhouse. His hands sometimes trembled and his eyesight grew dim, but he read his 3,200 books and wrote nonsense in the margin when he didn't agree with the author. He took long walks, he played with Abigail's new puppy, and he served pudding to his 14 grandchildren. Sometimes he thought about the good old days, and sometimes he must have missed talking to his old friend, Tom. I always loved Jefferson, John said. So they're getting what? Oh. 
Friends like Benjamin Rush, who signed the Declaration of Independence along with Tom and John, said, For goodness sakes, why don't you two just make up? Still, John wouldn't do it. Neither would Tom. But somehow, John must have kept thinking about his old best friend, because on January 1st, 1812, he picked up his pen. Dear sir, John wrote, all of my family are well. I wish you many happy new years. He signed the letter. He mailed it to Thomas Jefferson and waited. Would Jefferson write back? What do you think about that day, uh, January 1st? What do you think the significance is that he might choose to write to his friend? New Year's Day. And what do some people do? They make resolutions, right? So maybe his resolution was to patch up a friendship. Uh, I think he's in Virginia. That was where he lived, right? But is it hot in Virginia? Uh, warmer than here. One month later, the postman brought a letter. John tore, it op tore open a letter. The letter was from Tom. John answered right away. After 11 years, there was much to say, and Tom and John could hardly write fast enough. When John's son, John Quincy Adams, was elected the sixth president of the United States, Tom sent congratulations. When John was feeling silly, he made jokes. Once he signed a letter, J.A., those are his initials, on the 89th year of his age, still too fat to last much longer. And when Tom said they both ought to forget about their big fight that had ever happened, John was so happy it was the best letter ever written, he said. After all, John told Tom, you had as good a right to your opinion as I had to mine. Yes, Tom said, people could have different ideas and still be friends. So it was all right that sometimes John thought one way and Tom thought another. Little differences didn't matter because Tom and John were best friends. Sick or well, they kept on writing to each other. <coughs> and when Tom and John both died on the very same day, July 4th, 1826, the 50th birthday of American independence, the whole country was sad. And people all over the United States stopped to remember them. They remembered that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams had been presidents and vice presidents and ambassadors and sometimes bitter enemies. But most of all, uh, people remember that Tom and John were best friends who had helped America grow up together. Isn't that amazing that they both died on the same day and that it was July 4th, the 50th anniversary of American independence? Mm -hmm.